So you need to Okay, I'll turn everything on now. I think, I think we're good. There's only one of your mic. Let's see, next time. You gotta give me one of your. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this 15th session of the City's Wildlife Speaker Series. I am so very pleased to see so many of you have made it out here tonight, despite the weather forecast. Um, very impressive. Thank you all. My name is Amy McPherson, and I work in the City's Natural Systems and Rural Affairs Unit here at City Hall. Bonsoir tout le monde. Bienvenue. Tonight's presentation is being broadcast live on YouTube, and so we would like to welcome all those who may be listening at home. For those of us in the room, a little bit of housekeeping. Please note that if there is any kind of an emergency, we have three exits in this room, the one that you all came in, and then there's also two doors at the front of the room. You can see the bright red exit signs there. Also in this room, you may notice we have flags representing the peoples of our Algonquin and Anishinaabe host, host nation. We recognize here at the City of Ottawa that Ottawa is built on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nation. The peoples of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe nation have lived on this territory for millennia, and their culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. We would like to honor the peoples and lands of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation, and we would also like to honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, their elders, their ancestors, and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. The goal of the speaker's existence with wildlife 
by increasing residents' understanding of the animals that we share our city with, our wild neighbors. Mutual respect is a key part of coexistence, particularly where predators and large animals are concerned. There's an old saying about good fences making good neighbors. And in some cases with wildlife, that's literally true. If you're trying to protect your garden or your livestock. In other cases, it simply means that we need to respect each other's boundaries and personal space. And for coyotes at this time of year, personal space is particularly important. Uh, our speaker tonight, Dr. Stan Garrett from The Ohio State University, will explain why that is in his presentation. Dr. Garrett was actually our very first speaker in this series back in February 2014. He and his team have been studying coyote populations, ecology, in and around the city of Chicago for 20 years now. It's an extraordinary program of research which has produced incredible insights into how coyotes have adapted to living in and among our cities in urban, suburban, and rural settings. And so we're very pleased to have him here back in Ottawa to share his findings, uh, address some common misconceptions, and help us all understand how to reduce the risk of conflicts with coyotes. So I'd like you please to all welcome Dr. Stan Garrett. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, good evening. Um, everyone can hear me OK? Um, and hopefully the YouTubers uh, can hear this. Uh, this is a new experience for me as well. So don't know if I like being live on YouTube. Um, so I'm lucky to be here because uh, I had an issue last, last night coming through your customs. Uh, so I got delayed. Um, I got sent to the back room for a couple hours. Um, so <clears throat> it turns out that um, uh, when I was explaining to them why I'm coming into your country, um, the person did not think, he did not understand why there would be someone studying coyotes in cities. He'd never heard of such a thing. Um, <laughs> and he definitely didn't uh, understand why someone would uh, go to different cities and talk about this stuff. Um, he also didn't understand why the city of Ottawa would have any interest in having me come and speak uh, about this subject area. So he didn't believe that part. And then the final part he didn't believe was that he didn't think I told him I would be giving a presentation to the general public. And he said, who would want to hear you give any kind of talk about that? <laughs> so, so I had no chance uh, at all. Um, I wish I could send him a picture. Um, so, but I did notice, um, so he didn't believe anything I told him, and he did, he told me over and over again, he says, I don't think you're being forthright, and you're being truthful. Um, and I did start to think, well, uh, there's something about me. So I may give off this uh, very shady kind of character, <laughs> something, which is kind of disappointing, because you like to think of yourself as being a very honest looking person. And so maybe I have the wrong view of myself. So I was thinking about this last night, and I thought, well, I'm going to be talking about a pretty um, controversial animal. Um, it's a, a lightning rod for people's emotions. I always deal with this every time I talk about this animal. There's always some people that really love them, a lot of people that really don't love them. Um, and I'm going to be talking about them. And so uh, just to get this out there, I will, everything I talk about will be the truth, um, the be as far as I know. I'll be sharing with you um, results from our research. And as Amy mentioned, uh, I've been very fortunate to be the PI of a, a long-term project. It's very rare to, uh, for any animal to be able to study them continuously for two decades and have that kind of support. And we have had that kind of support. It's been pretty amazing. Um, and so I will be sharing with you what the things that we've learned. And so everything I talk about is totally supported by by years of data. Um, in some cases, it's more years. In other cases, it's less if it's a new um, subject area. So I promise you that that's what I'll be talking about. If there's something that we don't know, I will say we don't know that. Um, so uh, it, even if I'm giving off this shady appearance, at least uh, the information on the slides is, is trustworthy. Um, so what I'm going to do 
to start off, I need to talk a little bit about um, the animal itself. I'm going to test this to see if it works. Good. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the coyote, uh, just a couple characteristics so that we're all on the same page. Um, every time now I have to give a talk, uh, there's always this question about, well, what kind of coyote do we have here? And definitely up here in the Northeast, there's a lot of talk about in um, articles and shows about coy wolves or um, a different kind of coyote that you might have. And so I want to, I have to tackle that first because some of you will be saying, well, you study coyotes in Chicago. What does that have to do with these huge, humongous, scary animals we have up here? So I'll touch that, I'll touch on that first. Once we understand that we're talking about the same animal, then I'll share with you uh, some of the things we've learned about them in Chicago. And a lot of that will start off with ecological stuff. The idea here is that um, if you understand more about how the animal functions and works, then you can actually understand why certain um, actions and responses are more effective than others when we talk about the last part, which is the actual conflicts. So we will get to conflicts. And those often that's why people are here. And they just want to know, well, how do you get rid of them? Or how do I protect my dog? But we have to go through this other stuff before we can get to that. So uh, you just have to bear with me, but we will get to that. Um, so the coyote is a uniquely North American species, so it's not found in other parts of the world. Um, prior to um, European colonization, that was basically the ancestral range of, of coyotes. So they were a Western species, especially a wide open space kind of species. Um, but then in the last 50 to 60 years, uh, they've expanded their range to take over most of North America. And in fact, I haven't updated that slide. I've been showing that same slide for um, almost 20 years now. And I've cut off parts of Canada there. So in fact, one of them is my own study area over in Nova Scotia. So Nova Scotia and Newfoundland definitely have coyotes there. They're found everywhere um, from the Arctic Circle down. And in fact, in the most recent years, that are expanding the range even further, you'd think, well, how can they? There's not much left. But they just crossed the Panama Canal. So um, now there's a whole new continent just waiting for coyotes to come in. Uh, and so that'll be an interesting um, story um, down south. Um, that huge expansion, that range expansion, during those decades took place also during the decades where, especially in the US, we had the greatest amount of predator control and removal taking place. Um, and more coyotes were killed than any other mammalian predator. Even though the, the targets were wolves and mountain lions and bears, more coyotes were killed. Um, but unlike those larger carnivores that were actually exterminated from most of the West, um, coyotes increased in number. So it's an important lesson there. Um, and even today, we're still killing a lot of coyotes. So that's a current picture. Um, so we have um, over in the US, we have a, a federal agency, USDA Wildlife Services, uh, that's uh, in charge or um, is charged with the responsibility of controlling predators for a livestock predation. And so they kill about 80,000 coyotes or a little bit more each year. That's reported, and there's probably more that, that aren't for one reason or another. And then in addition to the, the, the governmental agency, then we have uh, the actual fur harvest and, and hunting that takes place. And in most states, um, it's year-round hunting. Um, uh, you, can, you can kill a coyote any day of the year. You can, you can kill as many as you want. There's, for a game animal, they're the least protected animal in, in the states. Um, and of course, you have a few bounties and things like that. So um, if we just look at pelts that are turned in, you're looking at a little over 300,000 annually. Uh, but that's not including all the animals that are not turned in in terms of pelts. So that's an underestimate. And then um, that these numbers don't include all of the, the nuisance kills, the inadvertent kills, um, and other things. And there's thousands of those as well. And then finally, um, if you combine all those together and you put in a few other finagle factors, most people agree that somewhere between 500,000 to 800,000 coyotes are killed every year in North America. So um, that's, they handle that just fine. Uh, that's no problem for coyotes. They don't need that kind of, any kind of protection. Um, so that's what's going on. In fact, um, I'm not responsible for this estimate, so I haven't verified it. I haven't done the math, but it does seem about right that roughly a coyote's being killed about every minute um, throughout the year. So that's the kind of uh, pressure that they're experiencing from us on a regular basis, and they've been experiencing that for many, many decades. So what we've done is we've created an animal that was already well adapted for that kind of persecution uh, even before 
um, European colonists came here, but we've even made them better. And so they're really good at it. And it also primed them to be able to exploit new and novel environments like cities. Um, so that's a, a little picture of one of our, our urban animals, um, mousing. And so they're really good at a variety of different things, but, but um, hunting and chasing rodents is actually one of the best things that they do. That does make up most of their diet across the range, including in cities. Uh, but it's a good example. I want to show you one of our animals, um, um, mousing. Uh, this is going to be just outside of what we call medieval times. That's a restaurant uh, that's a castle. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of medieval times, but this is the medieval times coyote. So she's mousing um, across from the parking lot. And um, uh, let me see. So. I'll start it. I want you to notice this is in winter, and when I start this video, she's looking for rodents. Well, she's listening for them. So look at the snow. The snow is completely undisturbed. And then watch what she does. So she can't see anything. So, and when they're in the mood, and when um, uh, the food is good, when it's a good year for, that's a vole, that's their favorite rodent, um, they can um, take about a vole every 15 minutes or so, sometimes more if it's around a, a woodpaw. So that's an urban coyote, but they still have those skills. Um, they're really good at what they do. They're also the perfect size uh, for having a very broad niche. Um, if they were smaller, say a fox size, they would have to live off of rodents exclusively, which is what uh, they are capable of doing, and many of them do that. If they were bigger than a coyote, um, they be, if they approach wolf size, now they have to kill big things. And they can't live off of small things for any length of time. But because they're the perfect size energetically, they can live off of a wide range of prey items, and they do. Um, so voles are their favorites. This is a, an alpha pair of um, animals um, are in our study area in Chicago. They killed that doe. So that doe is perfectly healthy. Um, the two of them together um, took her down. And I'm not showing you those pictures, because um, it's never pretty when canids kill ungulates. But they're capable of doing that. And this is, again, in, in the Chicago area. And they're doing that to a certain extent here in the Northeast as well. Um, their niche is even bigger than deer, though. So these are actually pictures of uh, another project that I um, conducted in uh, Cape Britain Island um, in Nova Scotia. So this was a few years ago, and we're just starting to publish some papers from that. Um, and that's where there was a, a series of major conflicts um, between coyotes and people there. And um, we did a, a study, and we realized, we found, on Cape Britain Island in the, the national park, uh, the primary food item uh, was moose. And so that's a picture of me in the winter there. That's a moose leg. That was a moose that they killed uh, that winter. Um, and so that's a 900-pound animal. Um, and usually, it's only two or three of them that's doing it. They're not packing up like wolves. That's usually the, the pair. But they use certain tricks to do it. Um, so I don't have time to go into that. That's actually a moose that was stuck in the snow. So they become vulnerable um, to to coyotes that way, and then gray seals. Um, never been documented before, but they were uh, depredating gray seals. Uh, that's a 400-pound gray seal. Um, there's a certain technique that they use. I'm not going to go into it, because it's not pretty. But uh, it's just an example of how adaptable they are in terms of exploiting new and novel food sources, such as uh, like what we might see in a, in a city. So um, a few years ago, it was actually a Canadian uh, production company that uh, filmed this uh, documentary. And I was, we're in it. Uh, we actually came to Chicago. And then I also, uh, we were in Nova Scotia for a little bit for that thing. And I didn't know, well, the title I was originally told it was going to be was not that. Um, I, it was after the fact. I should have picked up on it with some of the questions. But anyway, um, this is the documentary that came out. And it really kind of started this process of, um, introducing this term, coy wolves, into the literature. Um, and it's uh, been the frustration for a lot of scientists ever since. So the deal about this um, is that 
as coyotes expanded their range to the east, uh, they either went south of the Great Lakes or they went north of the Great Lakes. Uh, at some point when they went north of the Great Lakes, there was an ancestral interbreeding that took place, and um, what came out of the back end was primarily coyote with a tiny bit of Algonquin wolf gene. So um, I, don't, well, I don't mean to be disrespectful that your, your Algonquin wolves are not very big. They're kind of on the tiny side. So even though it's a wolf gene, it's a, it's a tiny wolf, tiny wolf gene. <laughs> So everyone takes a bit, makes a big deal out of this. First of all, the little, the, the percentage that's wolf is very small, and then of that, it's a small wolf. So people need to get, you know, kind of move past the whole size thing because it's exaggerated. Um, so that's we call them eastern coyotes, and it turns out that now that there's been some recent genetic work, what they've found is that basically all coyotes east of the Mississippi all the way down to the southeast of the US have a small amount of wolf DNA and varying degrees of dog DNA. And your coyotes have a small amount of dog DNA in them as well. The point is, is that they're coyotes. They may have a little bit of this or a little bit of that, but they're all coyotes, all of them. Even our Chicago coyotes, our Chicago coyotes are the same size as yours. How big is how big is what the the cuts? We're talking about average size is somewhere between uh, for females low 30s, mi males maybe around mid 30s pound, uh, pounds. Sorry, so 14 kil kilograms, something like that, 13, 14 kilograms. So they can get up to the, the mid 40s. The largest one I've uh, pounds. Sorry, uh, the largest one I've ever handled was in Chicago was uh, 49 pounds, and that was a giant animal, a uh, giant. I had to stand on a chair to weigh him because I couldn't get him off the ground. The tiniest coyote I've ever, for its age, the tiniest coyote I've ever handled, I've trapped myself and handled, came from that study in Nova Scotia. And those are supposed to be the big, bad um, eastern coyotes. And it was so small, the Parks Canada biologists refused to take a picture of me with it. So the, the point is there's just a lot of size ranges, even within a population. So you can have a big coyote, you can have a little coyote. No one ever calls me and calls in and say, I saw the tiniest coyote I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, real quick, if you want to see what it looks like. So it's the Mississippi River that's actually the, the division here. Um, and so um, coyotes to the east of that Mississippi River are the ones that have varying degrees of a small percentage of either wolf or dog or both. Um, including our Chicago animals. In terms of size, you won't be able to see this very well, and I, you don't really need to. Um, these are actually average weights of coyotes taken from different parts of the continent, including um, Canada, and I just have them structured by region, and so I just, you don't have to see the individual ones. Just note that it is true that the Northeast does have, on average, heavier coyotes, and then they get much smaller when you go to the Southwest. That's true. But it gets mixed up, and it's, uh, there's a lot of overlap between the Midwestern coyotes, again, those that are east of the Mississippi and your northeast. And in fact, my Chicago animals are not in there yet, so I'll put them in right now. So they're on the left-hand side there, and they fall in right along pretty nicely with your northeastern coyotes. So they're about the same size. So we're talking about the same animal, but ecologically they may function differently depending on what's available to them. So they can be doing different things, but it's still basically the same animal. And so um, as they expanded their range, they moved in, uh, they, they filled up every gap on the eastern part of uh, North America, and now they're filling in the last remaining gap, and that would be their urban cities. And so this is a relatively new phenomenon for uh, parts of, of North America from the central part to the eastern part. It's not that new in the southwest. Um, so, and that's what we're focusing on. So this is Chicago, and um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but um, as Amy mentioned, we've been conducting this research for the last 20 years, and we've had, um, we're addressing a wide range of different questions, and we have been for quite a while. Some are older, some are newer, and um, I'm not, you won't be able to see these, but um, population dynamics, um, their space use, um, their um, parasite or disease dynamics, their diet is a really important component, and I'll talk about that in a second. 
um, and their social structure. We'll talk about that because that's actually related to some of the conflicts that you have, especially this time of year. Um, their ecological role, so how do they affect um, other species, and then uh, their population genetics. And finally, the newest thing that we're focusing on now, which hopefully I'll have a little bit of time at the end to get to it, we'll see if I have time, and that's behavioral syndromes. And so when I say behavioral syndromes, I'm talking about personalities. So we're trying to measure personalities of individual coyotes. And the idea is that a personality is actually a genetically determined type of uh, behavior. And uh, the idea is, the, or the question is, uh, do cities tend to select for a certain kind of personality? And over time, do you start to see more of, the, of a certain kind of personality than another? So that's what we're trying to do right now. Um, but we'll focus on these questions. These are kind of the basic ones. And so um, we want to know how do coyotes live in these cities? What, how do they do that? Uh, what does that mean for us when they do that? What's the risk to people and pets? Um, and then the, uh, the coexistence versus conflict. How much of each of that is actually taking place? Um, if we have time, another part that we've been focusing on quite a bit is not just the risk that they pose for us, but also what benefits do they pose? Uh, no one really talks about that. And part of it is that it's a sad fact that for many mammalian predators, uh, the funding that's available to do work on them is driven by conflict. Very, it's very hard to actually get funding to uh, look at the ecological role that a predator plays. It's a little better for the charismatic species, like the wolves, to a lesser extent mountain lions, but for something like a coyote, it's not that charismatic. Um, it's hard to get funding to look at the ecological role or the potential uh, services they're providing. But we have been doing that. So the, my funding agencies have allowed me to dive, diverge a little bit here or there. And over the years, we've chipped away at it. Um, and so maybe I'll be able to maybe touch on that a little bit tonight, if you let me. Um, so how do we do our work? So we, we live trap the animals. Uh, we use the, stand, the same kind of techniques that the fur trappers use, the same kind of traps. They're modified to reduce um, any potential injuries to the animals. And we take them to the lab and we, we measure a variety of things. That's an animal that um, is in a trap, um, about to be processed. Uh, we, we take them out of the, the area. That's a thing that you have to do for, in urban settings because you can't process an animal out in, in a, basically an open lab there. So, um, we take them in, uh, we measure them, weigh them. That's an animal about to get a fecal sample. Um, so you'll notice that I'm at the proper end of the animal. Uh, <laughs> there's certain advantages to being ch in charge, and so that's one of them. Um, and so that's an animal getting measured, and we look at their teeth. Their teeth tell us a lot about the animal, so we can look at their health, but also their age. and. Um, um, and how well they're doing. Um, another animal getting processed. Uh, that one's about to be released. So uh, we put a radio collar on them so that uh, the radio collars basically open up a window into their life and so that we can follow them, but we can also document their survival and their mortality as well. Uh, it's an, another animal. Um, so we, we track them a variety of different ways, but. The old standby is still the one that we spend most of our time doing, which is that's a VHF collar. So there's a team of people that, that track these animals day and night um, every week of the year. Um, so we know a lot about how these animals move. And now we also use GPS collars. So satellites are tracking um, a subset of the animals. Um, those, an those collars are expensive, and the data are expensive to accumulate. But I'll show you where we put those. We put those on animals that are downtown. So there was one. Um, I was jealous. My uh, team caught um, a beautiful male this morning, um, and he is in a pre prime spot um, right on the edge of um, a no the north and northwest side of Chicago. So uh, anyway, that's the, the animals that get the GPS collars. And so then in addition to marking the adults, then we also go into the dens each year. And so coyotes are seasonal breeders, and so they only produce a single litter, and it's always in the spring. So in uh, late April and throughout most of May, we're going into the dens once uh, for each litter and uh, microchipping the, the pups. And um, we do that for a variety of reasons. One is to look at the reproductive rate of the population, because coyotes scale the reproduction based off of um, resources as well as their own population densities. 
uh, but we also um, are curious about, the, again, their social structure and their mating system. And I'll talk more about that in a second. So that looks like a really um, a nice, scenic, natural setting for them to raise a litter. Um, but if we turn the, the camera to the side, then that's what we see. And so they're actually raising litters within just a few meters of, of people. And um, this is actually the, probably the most challenging thing for coyotes to do in an urban area is to raise a litter. It's when they're the most vulnerable. Um, coyotes are never tied to a single point in space uh, if they're healthy. They're not, they don't use dens themselves unless they're hurt or sick. Um, this is the one time, and this is when they are most vulnerable. So it's also where you also tend to get a lot of conflicts, too. So um, again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So here's just a few examples of pups, just because they're really cute. This is just outside of O'Hare. So that's an industrial setting with those cement things. That, that litter was horrible to try to get to. We were literally crawling through those cement things after those pups. So yeah. What time of year? They always have uh, their litters at the mid to late April, usually. So April's the prime month. Um, just some more urban pups. And uh, we, we do a lot of things with them as well. This is your typical four-week-old pup. So um, their eyes haven't turned yellow yet, and they haven't really developed. They're, they're not expressing personalities. They're easy to handle. Um, at five weeks, that's a five-week-old, they're beginning to look more like a coyote and their eyes are beginning to change. This is another five-week-old. Personalities are starting to be expressed by these guys within their litter. So you start to see some, some bold and some shy individuals. And then that's a six-week-old pup and now they look like a coyote. Um, and at that age, then they're gonna be uh, taken out of the den um, or they will themselves and they'll, they'll begin following their parents at that, at that point. And they won't come back to the den after that. So that's, it's a six-week window where they're really vulnerable. Once they, get, once they get to that stage, they can't wait to get them away from there. What's up? Where are the parents? Where are the parents? Yeah. Um, they're around. They're definitely around. And it just depends on which parents you're talking about. So some of them um, are more bold. Um, and so they will be standing there barking and pacing while we're, while we're doing that. Most of the parents, though, they're there. They're just circling around, but you don't see them. But they're there. You, we have the receiver on, so we can hear them. We can hear how their signal. So we know that they're watching us, but we can't see them. They don't ever come after us, no. Um, uh, so, but good question. Um, so in addition to all of that, I'm not going to have time to really show you much of this. The, the other little thing that we do that you may or may not see every once in a while in a program, these, these pop up every now and then. We have collaborated with National Geographic, and they sent an engineer out one year to uh, develop a special uh, critter cam to put under the, their chin, their, on their neck that tracks their, 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 their face. And so where they're looking, then they can, uh, we can see what they are seeing and what they're doing. And um, this is what uh, we're looking at. So this is a camera that's hanging down just below the chin of a, a female um, as she's walking. And so this has kind of allowed us to see certain parts of the coyote life uh, that you wouldn't be able to see. And um, it's actually been kind of interesting. Again, I won't be able to show you much of this, but you will see these every once in a while. Um, uh, so we have the National Geographic stamp on there, uh, but we, we basically are able to, I mean, we record those and then we send them over to National Geographic and they pick and choose what they want to use. So you'll see her snout coming down from above. And I will fast forward this um, from just a second, if I can do this. Shoot. Um, sorry, I won't be able to do that, but um, anyway, you get the, the um, the feeling here in terms of what we're able to do. One of the cool things about this, and we, I'm not going to wait to show this, but uh, we can separate scavenging from predation. So in this case, in this video clip, she'll eventually come across a bird. 
Um, and uh, if you were using SCAT analysis or stomach content analysis to look at diet, bird would show up there and you would, th you would think, well, she killed that bird. But they don't, they're actually scavenging. In this case, she's, she finds a dead bird and, and then she proceeds, it's a little songbird, she proceeds to take 30 minutes to eat one leg. She has to take every feather off the bird. <laughs> and so we were laughing when we were watching this. It's like, are, is she serious? Is she really gonna like pluck every feather off? So when it comes to birds, they're really picky. Now you notice that on that rodent, that vole, they don't care. They're, the whole thing's going down. But when it comes to the bird, um, they have to take every little thing off. So we're learning you know, kind of useless things like that too. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. So um, this is where we're at. So we actually, the animal that we caught this morning, I believe that was number, uh, yeah, 1290. So we're almost up to thir uh, 1,300 coyotes that we've captured in March so far. A large portion of those are the pups from those litters, but we've also captured a lot of the adults. And so it's a massive study. Um, and then, yeah, a couple, couple dogs and a couple people, un unfortunately. Uh, that's just working in urban areas. Um, so really quick and some uh, details. Uh, they, they are, even though you often see coyotes alone, they are a pack animal. They do live together in groups. It's just that they don't spend a lot of time together. Um, the howling that you hear is actually really important in terms of maintaining the social cohesion of an animal that often is not able to see each other. Um, and it's the territorial defense that's probably the most important aspect of them. They're living together in groups. They rarely hunt together as a group. Um, and they are territorial. Uh, so this is an example of what we do. So um, those red dots and those yellow dots are the locations of an alpha male. So he's the dominant male of a group living in a, in a park on the northwest side of Chicago. And the, the yellow locations are daytime, the red are nighttime, and that, that doesn't really matter. I just want you to see that just looking at it, even from a distance, it's really easy to see um, the delineation of their territory. I mean, they basically draw it for us. That's how, um, I guess, uh, faithful they are to their sites, and, and they patrol those edges. Now those edges happen to correspond with roads, and it turns out in urban areas in particular, they use the roads to form those boundaries. They also do the same thing out in the country, although in some cases it might be a road, or it also might be a fence line, or it could be a, a stream or a creek. Um, so they're using features of the landscape to, to mark and maintain their boundaries. In this case, roads are not a, a barrier for them at all, physically, so that male he could easily cross those roads. He could cross them any time of the day, easily. There's another reason why he doesn't, for the most part, and it's because of other coyotes. So um, those red dots up there are his locations. Um, and then if we look to the south, those yellow dots are the, the locations of an alpha individual of a neighboring pack. And then if we move over to the east, then those blue dots are the locations of an alpha animal over to the east. And so they're all using the same roads for those boundaries. And it's the social boundary that's keeping them from crossing the roads. It's not the, the difficulty of crossing a, a road. So it's, that's one part of the, of the population. That's the groups and that's the territorialism. And they basically behave a lot like us. So you can't see it because we're up too high, but those are subdivisions or, or uh, communities that are adjacent or even within those territories. Each one, in each one of those communities, you have a house and you have a yard, and those are all marked by uh, property lines to varying degrees. So they're just doing the same things that we do, it's just bigger. Um, so and those are the uh, territorial boundaries. Uh, like I said, they do it for us. Um, so the, uh, another example, this is within a large park. Um, they, they have increased in size, um, the population abundance. How they do that often is they'll give up parts of their territory to their adult offspring. So there's only one breeding pair in a group. That's the, the parents. The other members of the group are their offspring. And as they become sexually mature, then they have to leave. And so these dots um, represent the mother and the son 
uh, the pack uh, early in our study. And at that time, they were clearly um, together and they were sharing that territory. The father was there as well. Um, but then um, after a year or so, um, another pack took over part of their territory and he became sexually mature. So he, his territory, he became, he took over a little tiny part of the original territory. His mom took over the, the, the northern part and they separated and then eventually he he basically lived, he became an alpha male, and he lived in that area. It's about one and a half square kilometers for over a decade. And he had a single mate, and they produced a, a variety of different um, litters, and eventually his offspring became alphas in different parts of that same park. And so today, we actually have seven packs. And of the seven packs, five of them are from his offspring. Uh, the, the adults. And so each one of those colors represents a, another pack. Again, um, originally that whole park was one single pack. Now, again, we have seven. Um, so this is another picture of, of the most recent grouping. So again, even when they're really um, packed together like this, even when their densities are super high, they still maintain their territorialism. Even when their neighbors are their relatives, they still maintain their territorialism. So it's a very strong feature of their behavior. Yeah? Did I understand correctly that each one of those dots represents on average three coyotes? Uh, not each dot. Um, the dots just represent uh, the location of that animal. So the color represents an animal. That, that color represents three to five individuals. So that's their territory. Yep. So we're looking at, if you're looking at seven uh, colors, you're looking at 35 minimum coyotes, and that's not counting pups of the year. So there's actually 60 to 70 coyotes in there. Um, so real quick, howling is one of the ways that they uh, maintain these territories as well as marking. So they spend a lot of time uh, doing that marking. Um, I won't go into all the details about howling, but we've actually done a lot of research on that, and not all coyotes howl at the same rate, and uh, their howling bouts are actually kind of, uh, they sound chaotic, um, but they're actually pretty ordered, and there's certain types of communication they're transferring, but I'm not gonna go into that. Um, so this time of year is actually really important to them, this month, this is a big month for coyotes. Um, the, here's an alpha pair, they're actually tied. So if they're just like dogs, uh, I don't know if you've had the either fortune or misfortune, depending on how you look at it, of having your dog mate, uh, but every once in a while they get tied together. And so that's what's happening here. Um, so um, they do have another thing in common with this, in, in addition to the territorialism, um, they become romantic at the same time that we do. So it turns out that at this part of North America, um, their mating period peaks right around February 14th. <laughs> so, and I told you I'm only telling you facts and I'm not making things up. So that's not just a bad joke, that's actually the truth. But, they, but their hormone levels begin increasing and preparing for this event um, weeks in advance. And so they actually start, for the males will start in December, so their testosterone levels will start to build up and they'll start producing sperm in January in preparation for the female coming into estrus. Female, her, um, her hormone levels are shifting and altering quite a bit and she's only gonna become, she's gonna, like a dog, only come into estrus for a few days and that's it. And that's it for their mating. Um, at other times of the year, after they're done, hormone levels drop, and they can't mate even if they're in the mood. So um, this is it. It's a really important period. Um, and this is one reason why they are extremely territorial, and you may have a, an increase in some conflicts. Um, our research, um, so they are uh, a characteristic of the dog family is that they are uh, behaviorally monogamous. So monogamy is not common in the mammalian world. Most mammals are not monogamous at all, so they're, they, they, kinda, they want to try and mate with as many partners as possible. The canids, the wolves, the coyotes, and the foxes are behaviorally monogamous, um, but it turns out that when, just like with birds, which are also behaviorally monogamous, once geneticists start testing them, 
they find all kinds of cheating going on, right? <laughs> so actually, the, the monogamy is, becomes even more rare um, once the geneticists get, get into it. But no one had looked at coyotes. Um, so they had looked at foxes, and they looked at wolves, and, and sure enough, there's plenty of cheating that goes on with those. Foxes are the worst if you want to look at it that way. So highest levels of cheating goes on with especially red foxes. They're, they're just crazy. Um, so we thought, I just showed you maps of our animals, and that's just a, one example. Across Chicago, we're seeing these, these territories just packed right next to each other. And then we also have solitary animals that are floating through. So there's all kinds of opportunities to cheat. I mean, if they want to have multiple partners, they don't have to go very far. Um, so we expected to find, just like every other study has found for monogamous species, um, to find cheating going on. And we thought that this is a perfect test of it. Um, but that's not what we found. So it's the largest genetic study that's been done for coyotes and, in fact, for canids in general. Um, here's an alpha pair. We have happened to catch them together. So it's, off, it's quite common to actually catch a pair at the same time because they don't want to leave each other. When one of them gets caught, the other one stays and often gets caught as well, or they're there when we, when we show up. So they're, they can actually ride in the same cage together because they're so um, tight. Um, so what we found, we genotyped almost 900 animals. It's, a, a, again, a really huge sample. Over 300 pups have been genotyped. And of those 300 pups, it makes up almost 70 litters. That was um, over a year ago. So we're even above that now. Um, and that's over again. Uh, this would be about an 18-year um, period. Um, so what we found was that of all of that, um, we found no evidence of any kind of cheating, no what we call extra pair parentage at all, none. Um, we also found that the longest mate pair was over a decade long. Um, and in fact, we never documented a divorce. We still haven't documented a divorce. So there's no voluntary separation of an alpha pair. Um, only when one of them dies will they take on another mate. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, to me, it's a pretty fascinating thing, and this, this is not a major objective of our research. It's not why we're getting funded, so I have to be careful about how much time we spend on this. But just think about this. The vast majority of the animals that we've monitored are only going to mate with one pers person, one um, <laughs> animal in their life. One animal in their life. So that means that you better be really careful about who you pick. So there must be some major mate selection going on, but we have no idea what they're doing. We have no idea. It could be random. Uh, we do know that they're not related. So uh, we, we've only documented one um, alpha pair that shared uh, relatedness with each other. All the rest of them are the only unrelated individuals in their pack. So they do um, avoid that to some extent. Um, they also occasionally will adopt. And so here's an example of uh, DIN sharing, where um, the alpha pair somehow ended up with other pups in their DIN. So it's still monogamy. Um, they were actually the parents of the little tiny pups. There were actually four of the little ones and three of the bigger ones. In the, and we've uh, documented that occurring at least three different times now. Um, so they will, um, they have a really strong parenting instinct, both the female and the male. Very strong parenting instinct. So um, it's, not a, it's not surprising that they would uh, readily take on another pup if they didn't realize that it's not their own. So I mentioned that they can scale their reproduction based on uh, resources. So this is a, an example. So this is very typical of our litters in Chicago. And you'll find this typical in many cities where resources are really abundant. So that's a litter of 11 pups. And again, genetically tested. So they're all coming from a single female and a single male. So that's an example of what a monogamous species can do. Uh, the female doesn't have to raise all of those completely by herself. The male's helping, and in fact, the subordinates are helping as well. If they weren't monogamous, so for example, if you look at a litter of raccoons or a litter of bobcats, those are solitary animals. The male provides no help. Subordinates provide no help. Their litter sizes are small. Uh, four animals, typically for a, cat, uh, for a bobcat, 
Um, uh, four to five would be typical for a raccoon. It's only what the mother herself can raise. Um, because they're monogamous, they can actually pull off huge litters. And that's one reason why we haven't been able to exterminate them. And then finally, before I move on, uh, we have uh, the different colors. So um, I mentioned that we have a little bit of mix of, of a tiny bit of wolf and dog because they can interbreed, so they share the same number of chromosomes. Uh, this is from our litter. These are all related. They're all uh, litter mates. They have the same parents. But you see the striking difference in coloration. So we have brindle pups in that particular one. The male was brindle. He's the only brindle we've had, but that's a sign of a, of a historic or ancestral breeding with dogs with that dark color. Um, so but it's been rare. So that was one of the few examples that we have. So the question would be, why don't we have more uh, koi dogs um, or that hybrid between coyotes and dogs in a, in a city that has, in our case, uh, we have over 300,000 dogs just in Cook County alone. So why wouldn't that be more common? Well, there are reasons why we don't. So in the US and in Canada as well, I mean, most of your dogs are fixed in the cities. Um, the physical differences in some breeds and coyotes will prevent uh, that kind of breeding. It's just hard for some breeds to, they're just too tiny or whatever. Um, and then dogs uh, with owners are not free ranging, so um, the coyotes for the most part are going to avoid um, dogs with people. The biggest thing is that dogs are, are not seasonal breeders, so dogs come into heat at any time of the year. Uh, as I mentioned, coyotes are only physically able to mate during a very small window. So it'd have to be timed just perfectly. Then there's other reasons. Um, the hybrids are less vigorous, the sperm, um, and they're asynchronized. So they actually come into uh, breeding condition out of season. Um, so that's another kind of barrier between them. So, and then I like to say that coyotes have standards. <laughs> so um, well, we just talked about that. Um, so. Um, I showed you parks and these animals being territorial in parks. They're not restricted to parks, so they also live out in the, the developed areas. And so these are packs living among people. Um, and so you'll notice the way that they use them are a lot different, so there's gaps. And so they're trying to use every bit of green space they can find in avoiding the areas that are used by people as much as possible. And so that's what you see in other parts of the landscape. And this is what it looks like at night. So for them to be able to get from green space to green space, they have to become nocturnal. And so this is one of our coyotes, 571, who lives in a completely developed area, or she did. Um, and this is just her at, at night trying to avoid people as much as possible. Um, I like to show this because most of these people have no idea that the coyotes are in the neighborhood. And so these people are actually inadvertently feeding the coyote because they have food on the front porch. And I don't know if you can see, but that's a cat staring at that coyote. <laughs> So the cat knows there's a coyote there, but the people don't. So this is what we see every night. Um, this is an example of coyotes avoiding people. So they've restricted their activity tonight, which they don't normally do um, in rural areas. And then even at night, they're trying to avoid people as much as possible, like what she's going to do here. Um, and this is um, coyote number one. This is me recapturing her uh, 10 years later. So she started the project off in March of uh, 2000. And uh, fortunately, it was just by a fluke, she also happened to be one of the longest living coyotes in our study. So we've, we've followed her throughout her whole life for almost 12 years. And this is me, it was darn hard to recapture her, by the way. But the point why I'm picking her out, besides the fact that she was very long lived, is this is where she lived. Uh, she lived among people for over a decade. So those pink dots are her locations during um, about six months of the last year of her life. Um, and that's, again, the community that she lived in for over a decade. She had one mate in her life, that's her mate. Um, he's affectionately called Melonhead, or he was, because he had this big head. Um, and uh, they had a, a variety, they had eight different litters, and so they produced about 70 pups between the two of them, all living among uh, the people. So these are his purple locations. Uh, you can see that they, they perfectly line up. They were always together. And then she died of natural causes. Uh, she had kidney failure. And then he, uh, he upgraded and um, got a younger mate. 
So, um, and he was able to get one more litter out before he also died of natural causes too. Uh, this is him during his last year of life. Um, oops, sorry. So let me see if I can do this. All right. Um, he, that's a 12-year-old coyote. So you don't see 12-year-old coyotes in the natural world very often. Um, and this is after he had lost his mate. He was just he had just taken on a new one. Uh, this is actually a, this is another Canadian film crew. This is a videographer that set up a blind. He's actually living in a marsh right behind a Walmart. Uh, it looks like a natural area, but that's a Walmart. Um, and uh, he wanted to film one of our animals. I said, well, this guy is living in a marsh completely surrounded by people, so just set up your blind and you should be able to get him. So he set up his blind, and that's the first morning. Um, at 6 o'clock in the morning, he was still setting up his camera, and he realized, he looked up, when that film started, that was the start of his filming because Mountainhead was already staring at him. He already knew he was there. And then this is his reaction. And I just, I'm spending valuable time on this to point out that one of the things that we've been looking at over the years is are these animals that have been living among people year after year after year, raising litters year after year after year, are they losing their fear of people? And he's an example of an animal that never did. I mean, he's passed now. But he never lost his fear. Um, his pups all grew up and um, never showed a change. Some of them do, but it's more because of feeding. So if they're not getting fed, it is possible for them to live among people without conflicts. Finally, I'm moving downtown. So I've been out in the suburbs. Um, now we're going to move into the urban core. This is the last phase, the last um, six years of what we've really been focusing on because no one had done any work on coyotes in the urban core of a major metropolitan area. And um, so this is the same Chicago area at night. And you can see, just visually, I like it because you can see that the urban core, the downtown area, is there, you could argue that the ecosystem is different there than it is in the suburbs. So maybe the coyotes, maybe they can't even live there. Or if they are living there, are they doing something completely different? So we moved down there. It was very hard to do. Um, and we're still doing that. Like I mentioned, the guy that we caught this morning is on the north side of Chicago. Um, here's an example of a map. If we move over to the, if you move to the right, that's where we're moving into the urban core. Those are territories of those super urban um, coyotes. And this is what it looks like, um, just um, zooming in uh, for some of those packs, some of those alpha animals. And so they still maintain their territorialism. But uh, the way that they move through the landscape becomes even more linear. And I can imagine that it's a place like Ottawa. You have some nice linear features to it. Um, they might move quite a bit um, similarly. This is uh, the territory of Coyote 748, one of our super urban animals. Uh, they actually raised a litter right across from Soldier Field. That's the NFL stadium. Um, this is, let me see. Um, yeah, so this is that little picture of that coyote. That's on top of a parking garage across from the stadium. And the Sears Tower is in the background there. They raised a litter on top of that parking garage. Um, so it's just an example of how adaptable they are. Um, in terms of survival rates, uh, I'm not going to go exactly into all these numbers. But in general, your, your typical urban coyote, because they're not hunted and trapped in cities, immediately experiences a higher survival rate. And for our animals, that annual S represents the proportion of animals that survive a year. And so it's somewhere between 60 and 70%. For coyotes, that's a huge number. If you were out in the country, um, let's say the, the Midwestern US, where you have hunting and trapping, the survival rate is 33%. So it's half of what our adults are. And then if you go down to the bottom, our pups, the survival rate of pups is about 60% during the course of the year. In a rural environment where they're exposed to hunting and trapping, it's only 13%. Only 13%. So you can imagine that um, life is really good for coyotes in an urban setting. Um, one of the reasons why they have such a high survival rate is that they learn how to cross roads. Um, and so I'm not going to go into all the details about how we analyze that, but we can actually model that. We can actually calculate the risk that each coyote has in terms of being hit by a car. 
Um, for example, those polygons are um, packs. They're living just outside of O'Hare. If we overlay the road system, you can see that different packs have or, uh, different number of roads that they might have to cross um, as they're going through their territory. So you would imagine that they have different levels of risk or different probability of getting hit by a car. But I can tell you that not only for these animals, but across Chicagoland, they all have exactly the same probability of getting hit, which is low. It doesn't matter how many roads they have in their territory, and it doesn't matter what their traffic volumes are. They scale uh, their ability to move across roads based on um, risk. So they all have the same um, level of, of risk. Here's an example of one of those uber urban animals crossing roads. And so this is at night, because they have to be nocturnal. Um, this is our Lincoln Park animal. And they have to use the sidewalks and the roads, just like we do. So this is her going down one of the sidewalks. And uh, in just a second, she's going to cross the road in front of us. And this is a, a just one block off of a major thoroughfare. And so there's not much traffic here. So this is not, this is not too exciting. So she can easily move across and not worry about traffic here. But um, the next frame, so there she moved in front of us. The next frame, um, she's going to actually move across a very busy road. Um, this is just off of Lakeshore Drive. So to do that, she's going to take a different approach. So here she's going to cross the road. She's going to move over to the sidewalk as she approaches that street. And uh, you may or may not be able to see this, but there's the traffic's coming from one direction. As she approaches that stop sign, she's looking to the left in the direction of the oncoming traffic. In this case, um, the traffic is a constant flow. So she saw a gap, and so she shot across immediately. Um, she did not hesitate. So this is, I'm going to show you a different strategy. This is the same animal, same night, a different part of her territory. Um, so you're going to see a guy passing us on a cycle, on a bicycle. He's staring at us because of, we have a big antenna coming off the top of our truck. Right behind him is her. She's been sitting there watching the traffic. And she waited until it was stopped at the light. So then she could cross on her own. That's the same animal that you just saw using a completely different strategy for a different road. So where there's stoplights, she knows she doesn't have to hurry across. She just has to wait at the corner, just like all of us. So they do um, learn how to do this. Um, so real quick on diet. Um, I showed you at the very beginning that rodents make a large part of their, of their diet. That's true pretty much everywhere. Um, that's the stomach content from a single coyote um, in our area. So that's nine rodents. Um, so that's a big part. Uh, but our big question is human foods. Like how much are they relying on us for their food? both in terms of our refuse as well as for our pets. And there's a variety of different techniques for doing that. We're the first study to actually use a technique called um, stable isotopes. And so what we can do is we can snip a whisker from their muzzle, one whisker, and we can suction that whisker into little sections. And we can analyze each one of those little sections for their diet. And so by doing that, we can actually look at an individual animal where we know their age, their sex, their size, their condition, and we can follow their diet through the length, the, the window of time that it takes to grow that whisker. And we can look at each section to see if it's recent diet or old diet. Um, so I'm not going to um, go into a lot of detail here, but it turns out that um, we look at carbon and nitrogen. Carbon is on the x-axis. That's the important one because our human foods are all carbon-based. And more specifically, it's corn-based. And so that's a different um, signature than natural foods for them. And so those gray circles are their food items and where they show up on the isotopes. And what we wanted to see are human foods different on that x-axis than the natural foods. And it turns out all of those gray things over on the left, that's all natural food. Um, and then what's over on the right is all human food or pets. That polygon up on the top are pets. Those little colored dots scattered around there are individual coyotes. And where they fall out on that landscape reflects what their general um, diet item was. Now, that's just pooled across their segments. So there's more detail there. 
But the point is, is that we're able to show that there are some coyotes that are using human foods. Some of them are on the right-hand side of that line. That line that goes down the middle is what we call the anthropogenic line, or the human food line. So there are some coyotes that are eating over there, but many of them, the majority, are still eating natural foods, even in the most urban parts. And then if these are the urban animals, the ones that are really downtown, and you can see that there's a huge range. So some of them are eating uh, human foods. Um, others are eating natural foods. You'll see up at the top, rats. None of them are eating rats. We have yet to document a single coyote eating a city rat. Uh, we wish they would, but um, they don't. And it's actually, it's probably pretty smart for them because there's a, a huge rodenticide you know, program in Chicago to poison rats. And so it's probably a good move on their part. I just want to point out a couple of quick things. These are two animals, 740 and 748. You actually saw one of them, 748. Um, he's a super urban one that was raising the litter on top of the, the garage. His diet is almost exclusively rabbit. He has a completely urban, urban, uh, the most urban uh, territory you can have, and yet his food is almost completely rabbit. Um, on the other hand, you have 740 over on the right-hand side. His diet is basically human or pretty close to human. And so that's 740. And um, I caught him in a cemetery. And I've shown you all these maps of all these extensive movements that these animals have made. He got one of those really expensive $5,000 GPS collars because we thought he would be moving through the city. This is just on the north side of the city. And it turns out that he never left the cemetery ever. Um, so that's like thousands of dollars spent all in that cemetery. And the reason, and this is really important, the reason is that he's getting fed. He, uh, he was getting fed by um, two little old ladies that adopted him. And they put food out for him every day. They honk their horn. Um, and he eventually will come out and eat. But he's also never lost his, his fear of people, surprisingly. But that's what happens. If you feed them, you change their movement patterns. And all of a sudden, now they're focused in a certain area that they were not necessarily focused in before. And so that's an example of that. This is 748 again. He's the one eating rabbits in a completely urban environment. So you can't predict necessarily what their diet is depending on where they are. Um, let me see. Here's an example of uh, some of that urban life. So here's a, an alpha pair. That's the metra. Uh, train, and that makes up the boundary for their territory. And so that coyote in there is actually one of the alpha pairs, and they're marking. That's this time of year. Um, and so that's the, uh, yeah, the female is marking. She's the heavier one. And uh, then the male's going to come and mark on top of her. Just to give you an example of, um, Again, their monog the monogamy is expressed in terms of a really tight bond. So he's going to mark on top, right off of the metra. Um, let me see. This is another alpha pair. Um, this is over by Lincoln Park. And um, you'll see one of them. She's actually um, taking a poop right on the street. And then the mate is in the background. And so they're actually they're marking on the roads, um, just um, like they're traveling. And uh, that's how they maintain their territorialism and among people. And again, that's also at night. Um, and then one last one. And then here we have uh, getting fed by people. So this is, uh, if we have to pick one, I'm going to transition to conflicts real quick. So if we have to pick one particular item that is most important in terms of uh, contributing to conflicts between coyotes and people, it's food. And in some cases, it's people that are intentionally feeding coyotes. And in other cases, it's unintentional feeding. So this will be unintentional. This is one of our favorite coyotes who's going to get fed by people inadvertently. This is at night. It looks like daytime. But um, um, that's an example of, of uh, inadvertently feeding them. And so what happens is that when they're fed, then they change their behavior. If, it's, uh, if it takes place over and over again, they will start seeing people and places as sources of food as opposed to something to avoid. In terms of conflicts, um, through 2018, 
less than 4% of our animals generated any complaints whatsoever. So that means 96% of them are living among people and doing what they're doing without even getting a complaint. 4% generated a complaint. In most cases, it was just simply being seen at the wrong place at the wrong time. We've only, only 1% actually um, created a severe conflict like attacking a dog. So it's pretty rare. Um, they do take cats. So this is uh, your classic case of, um, of uh, maybe a coyote living in a neighborhood is when a cats go missing. Uh, I, talked to, I don't have time to talk about much. We did a massive cat study, and I was telling someone earlier, it's more complicated than that. Cats are actually pretty smart, and they actually figure out where coyotes are if they're outside a lot. If they're indoor, outdoor cats, they don't have an opportunity to kind of see what's going on with coyotes, so they're a bit more vulnerable. Um, the more important conflicts start with dogs, and so um, this is a time of year when we do see a spike in coyote attacks on dogs. Uh, medium to large size dogs generally are not hurt that badly. Uh, they usually are, are nicked up a little bit if it happens. Most of the time it's not. Um, so um, what we found is that uh, they're not using dogs as food. They're basically, their instinct is to remove a competitor. So if this is a natural environment, coyotes definitely kill foxes or they remove foxes because they're competitors, not because they're food. The dog is just another example of that. Um, again, in most cases, they're afraid of dogs. And in fact, uh, they, do, they do most of what they can to try and avoid them. But it, it does happen, and it can happen either through, for territorial reasons. It could be that um, if you fast forward two more months into April, when their litters are on the ground, if you have dogs off leash and they approach a, a litter, they will defend that litter. And so that would be um, threatened litters. It could be defensive. Sometimes dogs attack coyotes, um, and so you can have a conflict there. And then, again, it's rarely for food. Um, this is the seasonality uh, of the dog at, uh, coyote attacks on dogs. So again, there's a big spike in February. There's another little spike in April where you have litters, and then there's a drop off, and then it starts increasing again in the winter. So this is the time, again, when their territorial instincts are the strongest. Um, here's a quick list of some of the breeds in Chicago that have been attacked by, by coyotes. Um, and uh, uh, the, the numbers reflect, um, I think it was a 16 year period where they documented um, these. All I want you to notice is that um, the smaller dogs tend to be more frequent, especially small and noisy dogs like the Shih Tzus and the Terriers. Um, but it's not restricted to small dogs. So there are some large breeds up there. So <clears throat> there can be, under certain circumstances, um, a larger dog being attacked by, by a coyote as well. And then the most extreme form of conflict is when they attack people. And it's rare when it happens, but it does happen. This is actually data that we analyzed um, a few years ago in a paper. Um, and we're, <clears throat> again, as they move into cities, you get to uh, see a bit more of a higher frequency of uh, attacks on, on people. In most cases, they're very minor, uh, but there have been a few cases of more serious attacks. Um, coyotes bite people for, for a wide range of reasons. Um, what we found, there's some of them are um, because of rabies. So there was a recent rabies case in the States over in New Hampshire. Uh, that was a coyote that attacked three different people, but it was infected with raccoon strain rabies. Um, there can be pet related, so um, it, it often what happens, in fact this happened in Chicago last year, there's an altercation between a dog and a coyote and the owner tries to protect the dog and gets uh, bitten. There's predatory, so that is unprovoked um, attack on a, usually a small child. Uh, so there are predatory attacks. And then there's one called investigative that we came up with. We didn't know what to call it. These are cases where the animal and the person seem to be mutually uh, surprised uh, when they get nipped. So they're always minor. Um, and usually it's when, when the person is lying on the ground asleep. So they're lying on the ground asleep, and the coyote comes along and bites them, and they wake up and it scares the crap out of both of them. <laughs> so that's investigative. Uh, so there's a wide range of reasons why uh, coyotes might bite someone. Uh, it's not always the same. Um, in terms of preventing this, again, food is one of the biggest issues. Pet management, 
um, is a big one. So especially this time of year, you want to keep dogs on leash, especially if you're uh, walking them around green spaces. At least have them in view of you so that you can scare coyotes away if they happen to, to be in the picture. Um, if they're a small dog, you can always, if there's a coyote around, you can pick up your dog and, and walk away. Um, uh, hazing is always a good idea. So um, hazing is, is basically acting large toward the animal, um, not running away. That's the opposite of hazing. Um, and yelling at them, shaking. Uh, we've used um, coffee cans filled with rocks or um, other things to, to scare a coyote away. And then finally, um, uh, this is an example of what happens when people feed coyotes. So that coyote, as Justin, uh, my former grad student, he caught this coyote in this little marsh surrounded by a subdivision. So you know what these maps are now, but those green dots are her, her locations over uh, a one-year period. And so just look, there were no conflicts with her. She avoided people's yards. In fact, none of those yards had any fences but she was doing everything she could to avoid people's yards for a year. Um, and there were no, the only complaints about the coyotes, and she was one member of a pack that was living in that marsh, the only complaints was the noise they were making because they howled. And so that was the biggest complaint. She matured, she left that area, floated as a transient across the landscape, and eventually settled um, in a cul-de-sac in a community. And so those red locations are just her floating around, and then she eventually settled down here. So why did she settle down there? It turns out that, that there was a, um, a sequence of three, three houses that were all feeding wildlife, and I mean putting a lot of food out. So that's a picture of her uh, taking a piece of bread. They're putting out bread for raccoons. Um, this is actually, uh, let me see, yeah. So prior to this, when she lived in that marsh without any conflicts, she was exclusively nocturnal and she avoided yards. That's why there were no conflicts. But once she became older and she moved into this area that were feeding animals, she completely changed her behavior and now she became a nuisance animal. Uh, she, was, she was never aggressive, but she began to see their yards as a source of food. So she spent all of her time around their yards, and she became diurnal. She became active during the day. So uh, they wanted to have her removed. So as an example of how feeding can change the behavior of an animal, and it goes from an animal that totally avoided people in all conflicts with them to now all of a sudden taking the first steps toward um, conflict. So feeding is, if you have to point to one thing, that's one of the most important things, and it's the one that we have control over. So we can influence how much time coyotes spend in certain areas, how close do they spend, how close do they come to us, and how do they behave toward us is all things that we can control. Um, uh, managing the pets, uh, the harassment of coyotes, the hazing, um, and this is just another video, so I'll go, I'm going back to that critter cam. This is a, um, a cemetery that had a, an, um, they closely regulated, or they thought, uh, wildlife feeding in that cemetery. In other words, they had signage um, telling people not to do that. And when we, when I talked to the cemetery director, I asked if we could trap and put a critter cam on a coyote. She said, absolutely, we'd love to be able to see that. She assured me there was no feeding going on in that uh, cemetery. The very first thing that we saw with, when we, once we put that camera on that animal was that animal going to a spot that had dog food. So uh, they were doing everything they could, but there's a lot of feeding that takes place. In this case, it's intentional. Uh, so that's, those are people that are intentionally feeding coyotes. Um, so that contributes to the conflicts. Um, when you do have an animal that becomes aggressive, um, often the only solution really is to lethally remove it. Um, and so we definitely recommend that. If they, they're showing a repeated pattern of a lack of fear of people, and they haven't bitten anyone, they should think about possibly removing it. Um, if they've bitten someone, then they should definitely um, be removed. Uh, we, don't, we don't, there's no data, no one's ever done a study to see if you can change an animal's behavior once they've gotten to the point where they attack someone. No one wants to do that study. Um, 
uh, really quick, um, the bottom line here that coyotes are successful in cities in spite of us. So no one introduced coyotes into cities. No one's protected coyotes in cities. Um, so they've come in, in fact, in Chicago and like every other city, when they first appeared, every municipality tried to get rid of them. And all they did was succeed in being able to stay anyway. So they are su successful in spite of us. But uh, their ability to live with us relies on their uh, maintaining a certain level of fear. You have to be able to maintain that fear. And the public actually has a lot of, of influence over that. Um, so I mentioned this is, uh, we've had the benefit of uh, a lot of support. These are just a short list of some of the people involved. If you are interested in more information, that's our website, urbancoyoteresearch.com. Um, so a lot of the stuff I've talked about is, even, is there on even more detail. And uh, with that, if I have time, I'll take questions if you want me to. I know it's late. Yeah, I mean, it, it is uh, almost 20 after 9. But if we have a couple of questions that I can, we'll just uh, see if we can get the microphone. Shout it out, and I'll repeat it. I had a question about the territory size. Now, you were saying that the average pack had a one to two square mile territory. Some of these animals, obviously, are, are operating in a much smaller portion of that. Yep. So are you saying that that average size is the, the chunk of landscape that needs to have enough, what, natural habitat? And is there some kind of minimum amount of feedable habitat, natural habitat that they tend to use? Right, so the question is, um, you know, you're noticing the size of area that we, we um, reported, and it varies quite a bit. It depends on where they are in the, in the landscape. So those downtown animals need more space. The ones that are in the really high, high quality habitats in the suburbs need very little space. But we're still, there's pushing the boundaries on how much, how little space can they get by on. Um, and we're already um, uh, exceeding uh, in terms of uh, the smallness of their territories, anything that's been published in the literature. So we have some that are living in an area that's um, less than one square kilometer in size. That's a full pack raising litters. Um, that's the bare minimum there. That's a high quality habitat. Those urban animals, what we've discovered is that if you just look at the usable space, the green space within those highly urbanized sites, it actually, the, it accumulates, if you just look at that and you measure it, it ends up being about the same amount of space. So it looks like there may be a minimum threshold for them. But again, it's influenced by whether or not they're getting any human food or not. Human food can make them shrink even further, like that guy in the cemetery. A few days ago, um, a friend of mine uh, told me about uh, an episode with his Labrador dog. He let it out and uh, they're in a little green space and uh, the dog didn't come back so that uh, he went to find out what was going on and uh, there were two coyotes standing over his dead body. So they got a Labrador. I didn't see a Labrador up on your, uh, on your list there. Um, and just a comment about your crossing the border episode. Uh, I had the same problem going the other way. And um, uh, you know what I really think they're interested in? Uh, the, the one thing you don't say is I'm giving a talk because they're interested in how much money you're getting. That, that's, uh, they think you're B Barack Obama or somebody, you're getting 300,000 bucks. And uh, at least that's what, that was my impression on the American side. Right, well, and I should also mention that as an American these days, I'm in no position to comment on other countries' border <laughs> policies at all, so. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for the talk, it's very informative. Um, I was wondering what uh, strategies you have to dispel some dangerous myths surrounding caddies, for example, during uh, denning season where there's the myth that's going around in social media that caddies little dog to um, oh. Uh, predate upon and um, make food for the litter, which is a very dangerous myth. I was wondering what kind of strategies you have to dispel those myths. Strategies to dispel the myths? Um, all I can do is um, provide the information for people to, to try to uh, be informed. Uh, so we either like in giving talks such as this, um, publishing um, the results that we have. 
the social media is a difficult thing. I don't really know. I don't have a good answer for that. Um, that's a tough one that it's going to take someone smarter than me to try and figure out how to battle that. But that's a really good example. So that is a myth that has been around forever, that coyotes lure dogs in, um, and then the pack is hiding around, and then they attack the dog. Um, there is certainly behavior that they exhibit that's similar to that. And I can certainly understand where that myth comes from. But um, in many cases, what's just happening is that there's coyotes spend a lot of time uh, by themselves, but the pack mates are in proximity to them. When they're chased by a dog, um, they're going to go as, close, as fast as they can to safety. Often there's other coyotes there already. And so it's not necessarily that they're luring it. That just happens to be coincidence that that's where they're taking them. So, uh, but that, that myth will never go away. And uh, you'll never convince people. So I tell them that, and they choose to not believe me. So. So I'm just wondering at what point, like, you consider nuisance because right now we have um, coyotes that are coming to our fence daily after our dog and we've done everything and this is daytime morning night it doesn't matter the time of day we're seeing them five to six times a week like daily coming so at what point do you consider them a nuisance like and we've done the like loud noises we've done everything and they still continue and they're not they're getting to the point where we can be within two three feet of our back fence before they'll take off like they're no longer afraid of us. Right. Well, it's not, um, it's not necessarily up to me to determine whether they're a nuisance, because I'm not the one that's living in your house, and I'm, it's not my dogs. So um, like when I recorded those animals, like the percentage that were nuisances, that's, uh, those were coyotes that were reported as nuisances by the public. I didn't determine that they were a nuisance. It was the public determined that they were a nuisance. So you basically uh, decide when they're a nuisance or when they're too much of a nuisance, um, not necessarily me. Um, and it's also very difficult for me to make a, um, a, a decision like that when I'm not actually seeing what's, what the behavior is actually taking place. Um, sometimes people misinterpret what they're seeing, and when they, they describe something to me, it may or may not reflect it. Um, so it's very hard for me to provide like a, uh, a definite response when I'm not actually there. But what I can say is that if it's something that you're, if it becomes threatening and you're worried about it, then that's something that you should be reporting to your animal control agencies. Your neighbors, hopefully, they would also be reporting it. And if there's a shift in their behavior and they're becoming more aggressive, then they may have to be removed. Just know, and the one thing I didn't talk about, when you do a removal, um, it's always you, you want to try and understand why are they behaving that way, because uh, they will be replaced by no, by other coyotes. So if you don't understand what the root cause is, um, doing the removal itself may or may not answer that question. So uh, it's important to try and understand that. You might check to see with neighbors and see if there's anyone that's actually doing anything that contributes to the problem. Uh, as opposed to the solution, such as inviting them into the pro onto their properties and things like that. So often the, what we're finding is that a whole community, a neighborhood, everyone can be doing exactly the right things. It takes one or two people that aren't, and then it, it's, um, it, it um, basically minimizes all of the work that you're doing. So I'm sorry I don't have a better answer for you than that, but, but if you're you determine whether or not that they're a nuisance, not, not me. And it sounds like you have a, a, a building problem there. And locally, the, the number to call would be um, 311. I know. And yeah. Ah. We'll have to work on that. It's, if, it, if there's an imminent sense of threat, then you know, it, it, is, it is a call for the police. Um, you know, if, if someone is feeling directly, personally threatened, then, then it is a matter for the police. And yes, we would be talking about, you know, if, if there was a, an animal that attacked anyone within the, the city boundaries, then we would be looking at addressing that, obviously. Um, we're, we're running very late, but um, I, have, I, I know there were a couple people, so I'm, just, I'm going to take two more questions. So I'm sorry, everyone. We'll take two more questions. After that, it's up to Stan's goodwill. 
Um, I'll have a couple closing remarks after these last two questions. Just Hi there. Um, earlier you mentioned that in the northeast coyotes were bigger than they were in the southeast. Does that have to do because of the temperature? Like it often gets more colder up northeast? Is that one of the factors? Well, I, we don't know for sure, but most people are leaning more toward there's a, there is a slightly higher percentage of the wolf gene in your northeast as opposed to the southeast. So you usually attribute that, that size difference to that. Um, but uh, we don't really know for sure exactly. You do have a slightly higher percentage um, of, of wolf. It turns out that even though that was historic, um, there is still some hybridization taking place in Ontario between Algonquin wolves and coyotes. In fact, that's one of the biggest threats to your uh, Algonquin wolves um, is the breeding of coyotes. So there are some recent um, wolf genes being introduced as well. Yep. First, thank you for the really thoughtful and excellent talk. Um, very informative. Um, north of of, uh, of Ottawa, in the sort of north end of Gatineau Park, and north of there, um, there's talk of of red wolves or Algonquin wolves there, and overlap with uh, coyotes as well. And um, I, I'm wondering if there's ways you can tell them apart through their vocalizations. Oh, through their vocalizations. Um, I don't know. So that's actually a really good question because we know that gray wolves and coyotes have dramatically different vocalizations. Um, and there's actually some reasons for that. But the, the Algonquin wolves, I don't, I have not seen any actually measures to see how much, how different they are. So I don't have a good answer for that. If you ever heard, I'm, I'm sure you've heard wolves howl and coyotes. We call wolves the, the opera singers of the canid world and uh, the coyotes are the rappers. Um, so I don't, I don't know where the Algonquin wolf is on that, which way they lean. Right. So. I'd like to thank you, Stan. Thank everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, unfortunately, Councillor El Shantiri had to step out, uh, but we're very grateful to all of you for coming downtown on such a snowy day. Uh, we weren't sure what the weather would be at this time of year, but it is an important time of year to talk about coyotes because, as you've heard, this is a big time of year for them, and they're out there. So we would just like to present Stan with a little token of our appreciation. Thank you, Stan. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we, we hope, thank you. We hope you don't have any trouble getting it across the border. 